Welcome to Sheni Vachamishi. This is great. So in this uh, area here, in this hotel, I had an interesting story with a rabbi, Eli Mansur. He's a Syrian rabbi from the uh, Brooklyn Syrian Jewish community. Very uh, influential. That's what's important. Key. So I was speaking to two uh, mother helpers, right? They babysit the babies, they take care of the kids, and they were just out of some Beis Yaakov Yeshiva. Good conversation. As soon as I met him, uh, coming by right before the Dafya I said, Hey, Rabbi, and I paid him his respects. And, and then we talked about a class he gave the other day. It's a Pesach, it's a, he's going giving. And then um, he got a little bit uh, overwhelmed, and I didn't mean to overwhelm him. I wanted to give him stuff that he could chew. And being overwhelmed, he was offended. And uh, you don't have to be offended when you're overwhelmed, but unfortunately that's usually the case. Uh, when people learn new things. New things meaning you sit in a class and you go, wow, this is a new idea. Sometimes you learn, but you're really learning the same things. It's uh, reaffirming the same old myths and beliefs of yours, right? So he mentioned. So when uh, naturally, because he was offended and he wanted to attack, so he said to me, uh, "Go back and uh, continue talking to the girls." Now I thought about it, and I thought about it deeply, and I thought about the context, the culture, the historical, and I said, wow. Uh, I said, you know, Rabbi, those girls, uh, it's a lot of fun talking to them and hearing what they believe, um, but it's not as exciting as speaking to you, for me, right now. And um, in our culture, I said something, and I was being a little bit disingenuous, but I got my point across disingenuous because it's um, it's kind of true but you can it kind of has some problems with the story I said to him in our culture the Ashkenazi Jews women are uh, not there's no shame in talking to girls or women there was nothing uh, there was no shame in it you may have a shame from the culture you're from from Syria from your close-knit community you're not exposed to the outside you go to Deal, New Jersey, but you don't know that next to Deal is Princeton, New Jersey. And you'll see some women that know how to learn better than you. Gemara, the exact uh, subject that you're trying to teach. Uh, why was I being disingenuous? Because there is problems. Not only is there problems in the Haredi community, even in the modern Orthodox, you have a, a woman that wrote very well on Chumash, Nechama Leibowitz, Leibowitz, Leibowitz. Uh, sister of Yeshayahu Leibowitz, a philosopher. Nechama Leibowitz uh, used to give her uh, kuntresim, her writings, just like Rashi would give it, and he would be called kuntres, pirusha kuntres. Rashi would start out with kuntresim. He would leave it in the Bate Midrashim. And people would read it. She wouldn't write her first name Nechama. And this was for, for open-minded, so to speak, more um, educated and more uh, um, open-minded uh, 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 modern orthodox in Israel she would write Nun Leibowitz not her first name Nechama because they wouldn't respect it so I was being disingenuous but still of course Ashkenazi Jews have many women who are scientists and many women who are great academics and scholars who have achieved amazing things we're not just talking about business women which in the Syrian community, I know a lot of people that went straight from yeshiva to business. They never had a chance at education of whatsoever, humanities or philosophy, and definitely not science. So I said to them, you know, uh, in our culture, in the Ashkenazi culture, who am I speaking for? From Ashkenazis or secular Ashkenazis? Educated Ashkenazis or Haredim? Obviously, I didn't, I, I was playing with him, but it, I did it well and I got my point across. I said, we don't have any shame. Women carry no shame in our community because they're just, we know that they're just as capable as men. Maybe 500 years ago it was different. Another thing interesting, speaking about modern orthodoxy, there was a boy there and he was teaching the girls because there was nobody coming to his class and he was teaching Hashkafa, Judaism, Torah. He was just a, a YU boy that was hired to do a little Torah class for the younger people. 
Before he started his class, we were chatting at the same table with those two girls who were the mother helpers, Beis Yaakov uh, graduates. And we mentioned the Rambam, mentioned philosophy. And he mentioned, like, yeah, philosophy, if you don't watch, if you're not, like, taking, you know, it could be dangerous. So I asked him, dangerous? You know, these myths that even modern people believe because they don't think about it? And I said, what is the danger in philosophy? You ever have any, any, any uh, example of something that was dangerous? Did someone study philosophy and it was dangerous? What I understood and learned from that was that even, um, even Yeshiva University, if you go to the library and you educate yourself, autodictat, you get self-educated, which is very easy. And I always include the Library of Judaism in, my, in the links to my videos, so you can have access. It co comes on a SoundCloud and you can finish everything that you need to know that you didn't learn in Yeshiva. I take it from the best sources, Hebrew University, Yeshaya Gafni. I take it from uh, Jennifer Michael Hecht, who completed a complete history of Yiddishkeit. And uh, even in the YU, who we would envy as yeshiva boys, we would think, oh, they have, it, they have it better. They have a better education. Indoctrination still exists there. And it's very limiting. Up to the point where the boy says, philosophy is dangerous. Based on what? What's the danger? Science doesn't make it impossible to be religious. It only makes it possible not to be. You decide what's, what's good, what's right. You decide. Once you have the tools, you could decide. Of course, the boy thought it over and it uh, stayed in his head. He didn't have much of an answer because he was realizing that he was just repeating a myth. And I finished with Rabbi Mansour, Mansour, Eli Mansour, and I said, maybe in 500 years from now, we're going to have a scientist coming out of the Syrian community, and in 800 years, a female scientist. One more thing about the Rashi, so Rabbi Eli starts his daf, Mishir, and I sit down, and he knows that someone's sitting in front of him that knows a little bit of history. And he mentions about the reform movement and the uh, reform rabbi asking an orthodox rabbi about uh, Rashi. So he asks him, when was Rashi born? And the, ra the orthodox rabbi didn't know. And the orthodox rabbi says to the reform rabbi, I don't know when he was born, the date, but I know what Rashi says. So I explained to Rabbi Mansur, the reform rabbi was not asking Rashi's birth date. He was asking who influenced Rashi. Who did Rashi read? Who did Rashi study? Especially which philosophers was he influenced? We know the Rambam read Averroes and he was influenced by Averroes. And Averroes said that whichever God you believe in, he's not involved with the goings-on in this world. He has no idea about the goings-on. Well, the world itself can show you that. Uh, and I helped Rabbi Mansur, who is just repeating a story and he doesn't get it. He has no relationship with the text that he's reading which is very important, speaking about from yeshiva to the library or from yeshiva to any formal education. You need to have a relationship with the text. I explained to him, the reform rabbi really, it's important when Rashi was born because you want to know what era and what location he was, right? But what was important is who influenced Rashi. Unless you believe Rashi had some magical insights coming, popping into his brain. But uh, again, once you resort to magic, I can't help you. Thank you for watching. There was a Yid and he was sitting and listening to my entire upload. So before you guys get it, he got it. He was sitting and he was listening and he was like, Can I interrupt? Call to.